So good afternoon, um, good evening if you are joining us from um, across the Atlantic, and good morning if you are joining us from the West Coast. I am Magda Tedder and I'm the Schwittler Chair in Judaic Studies here at Fordham University. And I'm delighted to welcome you today for a, a wonderful panel discussion, which is also a book lounge of the magnificent book, Be Fruitful, uh, the Etrog in Jewish Art, Culture and History. Um, the panel will include two of the editors of the book, Sharon Lieberman Mintz and Joshua Teplitsky. And we were supposed to have two of the contributors, Deborah Kaplan and Alexander Kay, but Deborah Kaplan is unable to join us, unfortunately, due to personal emergency. None of the um, speakers uh, in today's panel are strangers to Fordham, and we have shared um, with you their important work uh, a number of in, in a number of ways, a number of webinars, symposia, and workshops. So I hope you'll welcome, uh, welcome them again. Um, I am really delighted. I don't want to take too much time because we, um, we have uh, one of our speakers running to class after the webinar. So I will just introduce them uh, to you. Um, Alexander Kay is the Carl Harry and Helen Stoll Chair in Israel Studies and an Associate Professor in the Department of Near Eastern uh, and Judaic Studies at Brandeis University. He's the author of The Invention of Jewish Theocracy, The Struggle for Legal Authority in Modern Israel, which came out in 2020 from Oxford University Press, and which won the Salah Baron Prize from the American Academy of Jewish Research. Uh, Alex is also the co-editor uh, with David Myers of The Faith of the Fallen Jews, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi and the Writing of Jewish History, and he's also the recipient of the Young Scholar Award from the Association of Israel Studies. Sharon Lieberman Mintz is the curator of Jewish art and at the uh, Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York and specializes in the art of Hebrew ma illuminated manuscripts and rare printed books. Over the course of 35 years at the library, she has curated more than 45 exhibitions and co-authored 11 exhibition catalogs. Since 1995, Sharon Lieberman Mintz also has served as the senior consultant for Judaica and Hebraica at Sotheby's, cataloging and appraising Hebrew books for Judaica auctions worldwide for, uh, for now over two decades. Um, last today, but not least, and certainly not the last to speak, will be uh, Joshua uh, Teplitsky, who is an um, associate professor and the Joseph Mayerhoff Chair of Modern Jewish History at the University of Pennsylvania. His book, Prince of the Press, How One Collector Built History's Most Enduring and Remarkable Jewish Library, was published by Yale University Press in 2019, and was the winner of the Salah Baron Prize from the American Academy of Jewish Research and um, the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award um, of the American, uh, I'm sorry, of the Association of Jewish Studies. The book was also a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Um, Josh is currently working um, on a book reconstructing a plague epidemic in 18th century Prague and its impact on the Jewish social and cultural life in the city. And we have heard some of his um, uh, thoughts about epidemics and plagues in Jewish history right after COVID um, hit all of us and stopped uh, and upended our lives too. Uh, Josh is the co-editor with Warren Klein and Sharon Liberman of the book we're launching today be Fruitful, The Etrog and Jewish Art and Culture and History, uh, which is available in New York from uh, Westside Judaica. And I will also send you a link um, uh, from Eichler's where you can buy it online. And in Israel, I, I hear it will be available from Pomerantz. Um, so before I hand off the, uh, the screen to our distinguished panel, I wanted to express my gratitude to all who make these public programs possible. Shavan Verletza has made sure that we have Zoom links and everything is run, running on time and taking, has taken care of all the logistics for today's and other events. 
I am particularly grateful to those uh, who support us um, at the center through their generous financial support, but also uh, to all of you who are coming and our audience who make, um, make us want to do what we're doing. So I want to uh, thank the Knapp Family Foundation, the Pickett Family Foundation, Eugene Schwidler, um, and so many of you in the audience for your generous generosity in helping us run all these programs. So without further ado, I want to say, um, um, share this. I want to <laughs> get the screen to turn the screen over to Josh and start our webinar. And uh, please look in the chat for the links to the events and where to buy the books. And feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section of the screen. Josh, the screen is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Magda, for that uh, lovely and generous introduction of all of us. Um, I too want to extend my thanks uh, to Magda Tetter and to Sarid Katan Gribitz and to Shiban Verletza for putting together this exciting event. Um, we, we produced this book as a labor of love and as something that we wanted to share with the wider public and an event like this is just that kind of moment. And so we're so delighted to have this wonderful opportunity. Um, I'll be taking on the task today um, in, in offering a kind of broad view of why we ought even to care about this small, particular, tart but sweet, lemony yellow object as a site for inquiry in the history of the Jews. The etrog belongs to the four species that are part of the ritual celebration of Sukkot, the autumn harvest festival that is just under two weeks away. And its three companions are the lulav, our closed palm fronds, the hadassim, myrtle branches, and the aravot, willow branches. Although the ritual is incomplete without all of the four species together, as we shall see today, Jewish texts, traditions, and artifacts accord the etrog a role of distinction among the four. The etrog is only taken for one week of the year, according to the rabbinic understanding of the biblical mandate, yet it has remarkable staying power. It's surprisingly ubiquitous in Jewish, as well as Christian and Muslim texts, narratives, art, and artifacts. And it's our contention here that the etrog invites us into aspects of Jewish history, culture, and art that have otherwise received only scant attention. Leviticus 2340 bids its readers, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day beautiful tree fruit, pre its hadar, palm fronds, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. In antiquity, this belonged to a ritual context of collective participation as one of the three pilgrimage festivals of gathering in the temple courtyard. The Talmud tells us that the extension of these rituals beyond the temple priests to the entirety of the Jewish people was one among an early set of ordinances designed to adapt Judaism to new realities after the temple's destruction. And ever since, rituals of Sukkot required the waving of these four species during uh, together during prayer professions for the seven days of the Sukkot festival. More, however, than solely a ritual object, the etrog took on different material and symbolic meanings. Over time, different sorts of imaginings by writers of late antiquity, the Middle Ages, early modern period, and even into the present, have thought about the four species in general and the centrality of the etrog in particular. Some Jewish thinkers, um, here, here's a, a panoply of, of different Jewish symbols together. Some Jewish thinkers associated the etrog with the very first mentions of humankind itself, identifying it as that forbidden fruit eaten by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Midrashic and Kabbalistic traditions viewed the etrog and other species as corresponding to the organs of the human body. They assigned to the etrog the attributes of the heart, to the other species, those of other body parts. And that association with the heart offered some irrationale for the rabbinic prescription to hold the object on the left side of the four species so that it would be held opposite the heart. A different homiletical direction conceived of each of the four species as representative of a different sector or subset of the Jewish people. According to one rendition, 
The etrog symbolizes the students who study rabbinic literature, the Mishnah and Talmud, and who are marked, like the etrog, as possessing flavor, aroma, and attractiveness, setting them apart from groups symbolized by the other species that lack aroma or flavor or attractiveness that the rabbis and writers assign to different subsets of the total population. Nonetheless, the combined use of these four species in concert offered even these rabbinic interpreters a kind of vision to propound an inclusive view of Jewish peoplehood. In their readings, even in acknowledging the wicked, the unlettered, the lazy, the shy, it was only when Jews of different qualities, both the righteous and the wrongdoers, like their symbolic representatives, the Lulav, Etrog, Arava, and Hadas, were combined that the divine will of the mitzvah could truly be realized. Now, the Etrog might have been abundant in the Mediterranean environment of ancient Israel and Roman Judea, but a, a signal problem for Jews from late antiquity onward was a question. How could diasporic Jewish communities function in non-Mediterranean settings? when their rituals called for resources that were not indigenous to the lands in which they lived. Although this problem was not unique to the Etrog, to be sure, given that the Jewish calendar is replete with laws and practices drawn from the agricultural society of biblical Israel, it was more acute. Sukkot stands out as a festival that most strongly commemorates that way of life, so that the Etrog, along with its companions, is indispensable for its celebration. Given this high bar to be met, fulfilling the annual obligation to take a ritually fit etrog could entail a significant expenditure of time, money, and labor. Emblematic of the kind of challenges involved with such expenditures and the creative challenges that, that they um, fomented was a figure that arose in late medieval and early modern Jewish communities called the esroger or etroger or simply etrog merchant, a figure who was appointed in numerous individual communities across early modern Europe to, in midsummer, traverse vast distances from Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, to um, Northern Italy, to cross the Alps and go to Northern Italy in order to select, purchase, and import etrogim and to oversee their transit and ritual fitness. These figures received the protection of the state for periods of travel and sometimes even provoked co controversy and comedy, as in the case of a Purim spiel that took such figures to task. Attempts at the careful regulation of such an esroger by communal leaders reflects the very instability of their relationships to their communities of origin. Unlike other local communal functionaries, the rabbi, the shochet, the cantor, the midwife, the nature of the Esroger's services as a traveling importer depended on distance. As soon as he was beyond the watchful eyes of the communal apparatus, his relationship with his home market depended on trust. The Esroger was thus obligated to swear an oath before his departure, an attempt to bind him more closely to the rules, but the force of that oath was not always so strong. In the process instead, communities devised ways belonging to material culture, um, the history of the book, texts to produce licenses, certificates, means of oversight, acknowledging the challenges that distance brings. Indeed, crossing borders was a perilous matter, and sometimes even a legally prohibited one, and importing commodities across boundaries was costly and subject to regulation, taxes, tariffs, and duties. The import of the etrog, as with other goods, required permission from the regimes in which they lived, and often protection from abuses. One elegant example survives in a privilege of safe conduct issued in mid-July of 1715, and a document of this nature gives us a sense of the timeline. The Esroger would leave home in, in July, usually, in anticipation of bringing Etrogim back to their local communities in September, October, and in our case in this year, October. And here is a safe conduct from July 14th, 1715, to Elias Gold of Amsterdam, issued by the Holy Roman Emperor and Habsburg monarch himself, Charles VI. The emperor extended his protection over gold to travel under his aegis from the Tyrol in Western Austria to Calabria in Southern Italy, unhindered and exempted 
from various excises and duties. The more the Jewish diaspora spread beyond the climate of the Eastern Mediterranean and into new ecosystems and environments, the more challenges and creative solutions arose. Scarcity, distance, and the efforts to regulate and control the acquisition of etrogene through trans-regional networks by means of negotiation, agreement, trust, and threats all emerge from the sources. And the primary sources are rich indeed. Administrative records produced by states and Jewish communities, the writing of rabbis, popular novels like you see on the screen in front of you from 20th century America, medieval illuminated manuscripts, ancient pendants, handbooks for customs, Geniza fragments, the observations of contemporary Christians, illustrations, and especially etrog containers, which we'll hear more about shortly, all attest to the wide reach of this little artifact into different aspects of Jewish and non-Jewish life. On the screen before you is a, is a fragment from the Cairo Geniza holding medical applications. Medical applications in both learned and folk medicine expanded the etrog's use beyond the space of synagogue and ritual life, and even its tiny corner of the calendar, ascribing to it medicinal uses, like curing skin disease, neutralizing snake venom, cleaning wounds, and treating halitosis. The etrog was understood in pre-modern Central Europe as possessing particular healing power for women during childbirth, associated with particular kinds of gender healing. In the modern period, modernity spelled new different difficulties for Jews in obtaining the etrog and ascertaining its fitness, and for the etrog itself, in even remaining relevant. Mass migrations of Jews from Eastern Europe to new centers of settlement in the Americas and eventually Palestine and then the state of Israel raised new questions and generated creative opportunities, as we'll hear from Professor Kay shortly. Oceanic connections moved the etrog across vast spaces. And as the distance of trade grew vaster, the etrog industry required new mechanisms of trust, authority, and oversight to ensure the quality of the fruits that arrived from far away. Again, provoking creative solutions, but just as often prompting and prodding controversies, competitions between centers, uh, and, and between economic agents at that. The Etrog's mobile character was itself so em emblematic that one Israeli steamship that you see above you here was actually christened the SS Etrog, and I hope you're able to make out on the screen the name of the ship Etrog there. Explorations of the Etrog continue to bear beautiful fruits, and I'd ask you to pardon the pun, but I, I just can't hold back from them. From antiquity to the modern period, people have observed that the Etrog is always fruiting and never barren. It had the power to knit communities together, engender long-distance cooperation, inspire the interest of non-Jews, and be a source of modern Jewish identity. But it could just as easily create feuds, stoke conflict across oceans, draw the ridicule of surrounding majorities, or simply sink into obscurity. The Etrog story is one of scarcity and ingenuity, of distance and presence, of connections of Jews to each other, and conditions of local contexts. In short, this tiny fruit is a microcosm of the long story of Jews themselves. Thank you. Now we welcome Alex Kay. I, I... Yes, Alex. So first of all, I just want to thank um, Professor Tater and, and um, Professor um, Katan Gribitz, who is going to be joining us for questions afterwards for inviting us all to um, this panel. And I particularly want to thank the editors of this magnificent book. Um, I really do hope that everyone listening gets a chance to purchase or read or borrow, just get their hands somehow on this book. It's a very special pleasure um, for um, somebody who produces research to have their work published in a book that's not just interesting and accessible, but is also gorgeous. This is a luxurious volume. The paper feels great. The images are beautiful. And it's somehow still extremely affordable. So I'm delighted to be part of this project and to be part of this panel today. And um, one of the things that Professor Toplitsky ended his um, talk with just now was the way that the etrog is a, a way for Jews to process their identity in all kinds of 
uh, different ways. And I'm going to bring us right the way forward to the beginning of the 20th century to talk about how one particular group of people used the etrog to do exactly that. And the people that I've written about and I'm, I'm very interested in myself um, are the members of um, the religious kibbutzim in Palestine and later Israel. Um, and these, these religious kibbutzim were similar to other kibbutzim in, in Palestine and Israel, part of the Zionist movement in that they were socialist communes. These are places where everybody lives together, shares all of their material goods together. But the difference is that a handful of the kibbutzim were religious kibbutzim. In other words, they were not only Zionist and they were not only socialist, but they were also committed to orthodox halakha. And the fascinating thing about the, this complex identity of socialism, Jewish traditional religion and Zionism altogether is that these three ideologies typically did not coexist in Jewish society, certainly not in the first half of the 20th century. At that time, most Orthodox Jews were not Zionist and were certainly not socialist. Most socialist Jews were not Zionist and were certainly not traditional, um, traditionally um, observant. Um, and most Zionists were also not halakhically observant and many of them were not socialist either. So on the religious kibbutz, you have the coming together of these three ideologies in a really fascinating way that produced all kinds of opportunities for Jewish self-expression, but also ideological challenges, one of them epitomized by the etrog itself. So you're a, an Orthodox Jew who's also a socialist living on a Zionist kibbutz in the 1940s or 1950s, and Sukkot comes around. You have to find yourself an etrog. Now, ostensibly, the etrog on a religious Zionist kibbutz is the perfect thing to express your ideology through, because as a member of this kibbutz, the members of this kibbutz believed not only in these three ideologies, socialism, Orthodox religion, and Zionism, they didn't believe in these ideologies separately, they believed in them together. In other words, they believed that an ideal world could bring these three ideologies together um, and that they fed off each other. In other words, there couldn't really be any tension between these three ideologies because they must, um, they must feed off each other to produce this kind of perfect society that broke away from the past and created this, this sort of new perfect idyll in, on, the, on the religious kibbutz. And the etrog should have been something that would do exactly that. Of course, it's a religious artifact. It's used in um, prayer services and as a religious observance. So that checks off the religion component of these three ideologies. Secondly, it's a perfect kind of mitzvah to perform um, as part of a new Zionist society because it is um, something that is grown in the earth and all the kibbutzim, like many other Zionists as well, really cared about going back to the earth and taking part in their own productive agricultural labor. So the etrog that could be grown in the soil of the land of Israel was a perfect symbol for the rebirth of um, Jewish life in a Jewish homeland. And um, so it seemed like a great symbol for um, um, for religious life, it seems like a great symbol for um, Zionist living, but what about socialism? And here the problem came up because the, according to rabbinical tradition, it's not enough merely to hold the four species, including the etrog, and to use them as part of your prayer service on Sukkot. According to the rabbinic tradition, when you hold and use these for the four species, you have to own them. They have to be your private property. But on a religious kibbutz, there is no private property because on religious kibbutzim, like on all kibbutzim, as soon as anyone joined the kibbutz, they automatically gave over all of their material possessions to the entirety, to the collective altogether. And this posed a real problem. How could you be on a kibbutz and yet own a personal property in the um, essence of the etrog at the same time? 
Now, by the way, the etrog was not the only um, mitzvah that posed this problem of private ownership. There are other areas of traditional Jewish law where ownership is important. Not many, but it does come up. One other example of this is the wedding ring in traditional Jewish marriage ceremonies, certainly from um, that time. The whole ceremony would only be valid if the male groom owned the ring and gave it as part of the wedding ceremony to the bride. And this also caused a problem in early kibbutzim. Many of them had this practice of having a single wedding ring owned by the whole kibbutz that would be given temporarily to the groom um, on the wedding day, who would then give it temporarily to the bride as part of the marriage ceremony. And immediately after the wedding, the ring will be taken back and put back into the possession of the kibbutz in its entirety. And interestingly, when it comes to the etrog, there is ample precedent for this kind of procedure in Jewish law, because as we already heard from Professor Toplitsky, it wasn't always easy to get your hands on etrog throughout the many, many centuries, millennia of Jewish religious practice, especially in places with colder climates where etrogim had to come from afar. And indeed, um, there was precedent already in the Middle Ages um, of a community having just a single etrog that would be held by the community and shared around all its members as they perform the mitzvah of using the etrog. Now, of course, according to religious law, the etrog has to be owned by the individual. So how this would work is that the etrog will be bought by the community as a whole, given to a person who would use it as part of their mitzvah. And as they were using it, the entire community, it was, was considered as if they gave possession of the etrog to the person using it just for the moment that they were using it. They would pass it on to the next person and the community would once again transfer possession to this individual as they were using it and so it would go. Now, this sounds like a good um, solution for the kibbutz. One etrog owned by everybody could be shared around and only temporarily owned at any one point. But this solution was actually rejected by many of the intellectuals and religious thinkers on the kibbutz, and it was rejected for two reasons. First reason was they saw this kind of um, legal process as exactly the, an example of the kind of sophistry, as they called it, the legal fictions that they wanted to get away from in their lives. They thought, how could it be that a whole community somehow understands enough about transferring possession um, to be able to do this with a whole heart? And on the religious kibbutz, one of the goals of the new Jewish revolutionary living that they were trying to create was to make religious practice organic and part of everyone's natural lives and not have to rely on sophisticated understanding of legal principles, especially those that included legal fictions. Um, they, they, they particularly didn't like that, that what they'd call hitchakmut, like sophistry or kind of fancy thinking. They wanted things to be more down to earth. But the second reason this, um, this idea failed was also um, more procedural. Even if the whole kibbutz owns an etrog, it cannot give it, said some kibbutz thinkers, it cannot give it to a particular individual, even temporarily. Because as soon as you take possession of anything, if you're a member of the kibbutz, that possession automatically goes back to the kibbutz as a whole. In other words, it's simply impossible to have ownership of anything, including an etrog, including a wedding ring, even temporarily. So it seemed to many on the religious kibbutz that this was a real problem. They wanted to weave together into an organic whole, socialism, religion, and Zionism. And in most areas of life, they managed to do that. But here was a mitzvah that they could not figure out how to perform with the rules being as they were. The end of this story is, in some ways, you may think a disappointing one, but I think actually an uplifting one. The, I say disappointing or maybe anticlimactic solution was that the kibbutz just changed the rules. The religious kibbutzim had a new set of bylaws drawn up that had a specific clause saying, nobody can own anything personally on the kibbutz except for the etrog, 
the wedding ring and other things needed for the performance of mitzvot. In other words, there was a carve out for the etrog and some other things like it. And in some ways you may think this is anticlimactic. Isn't this a great sellout? Isn't this a failure of the attempt to weave together these three ideological positions? I think of it slightly differently, which is that, you know, life is complicated. Our personal commitments and value systems may often go together and be in sync with each other, but often there are conflicts that arise. And there are really two ways to deal with those kinds of conflicts. One is dogmatism and one is flexibility. And dogmatism in a way is an attachment to strong principle, but if that dogmatism doesn't yield practical solutions, it will inevitably end in disillusionment and failure. The religious kibbutzim in this instance did something different. They introduced a certain flexibility into their lives that allowed them to keep their ideological commitments alive, all of them together at the same time. And this ultimately, I think, led to a greater longevity of the way of life that they were trying to promote. Thank you, uh, uh, Alex. Uh, and I want um, I I suppose I will just begin. Yes. Um, yes. The screen okay. is yours. Oh, thank you, Magda. Um, thank you, Alex, and thanks again to the organizers. I um, echoing uh, both Josh's and Alex's words. It's wonderful to be able to uh, kick off uh, our Etrog book in this uh, pre-Sukkot season, and it really has been a labor of love. Maybe we'll uh, Josh mentioned that before. Uh, maybe we'll talk about how this whole thing came about. Uh, toward the end uh, of the discussion. And I'd like to share my screen. Give me one second here to organize this. Uh, stop video. Mm, share screen. Voila. All right. And one more moment. Uh, okay. And so we begin. Um, I am excited today to be able to share with you uh, some of the research uh, and, and objects of the etrog in Jewish art and material culture that we kind of gathered as part of the creation of this book. And it was one of those uh, moments where Josh says, he mentioned like, it's a small thing. How, how important could it be? Why should we care? And when we began to look at it, and I specifically through the prism of images of the etrog and the material culture of the etrog, we found it was everywhere. I mean, you just like from antiquities onwards. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, briefly. Um, it's covered in several chapters in the book. I'll, I'll reference uh, the authors to those chapters, uh, but just sort of to think about where this begins. So there's a verse in Song of Songs, uh, excuse me, in the Song of the Sea, it, which, uh, which is uh, Exodus uh, Shmot 15.2, uh, and the verse is Zeke Livan Behu, this is my God and I will glorify him. And this verse is frequently quoted in articles and talks uh, on Jewish art because it is from this verse that the rabbis derived an interesting principle of hidur mitzvah, and that is the beautification of objects related to mitzvot. In the Talmud, uh, in Tractate Shabbat uh, uh, 133b, the rabbis explicated this verse and suggested, they said, what does it mean to glorify God? And they answered, one ought to beautify yourself before God in mitzvot. Make before him a beautiful sukkah, a beautiful lulav, a beautiful shofar, a beautiful tzitzit, beautiful parchment for a Torah scroll, write in it God's name in beautiful ink with a beautiful quill, and the writing should be by an expert scribe and wrap the scroll in beautiful silk fabric. And when we began working on this book, I said to Josh, Josh, let's make sure to include this passage from the Talmud that talks about the concept of Hidur Mitzvah 
and references the etrog. And of course, we went back to look, and the Talmud doesn't mention etrog. It mentions the sukkah, it mentions a lulav, it mentions the shofar, but lo and behold, there's no etrog in that passage. And this was kind of a surprise for me. Um, Shalom Sabar posits in his essay that there was no need to mention the etrog specifically in this idea because its centrality uh, was a given. It's a centrality to Hidur Mitzvah. The Torah refers to the etrog as a pre eitz hadar, and the question is how you interpret an eitz hadar, the beautiful tree fruit, a fruit of a beautiful tree, and that's another chapter in this book. But it has its own individual and distinctive concept of Hidur. So it did not need to be enumerated amongst all the other things. However, if you noted, one of the points uh, in, uh, in Hidur Mitzvah is wrapping the Torah scroll in a beautiful silk fabric. And so this concept, which we'll come back to later, of wrapping the etrog is, is something that um, maybe we take from this concept of Hidur Mitzvah, of making a pre eitz hadar even more beautiful by putting it in a beautiful box. But first, I wanted to step back for two slides and discuss the first appearance of the etrog in Jewish visual arts, because it goes back all the way to the Greco-Roman period. On this slide, we see several objects created for both private and communal use, uh, adorned with the image of the etrog and other temple implements. Um, and these date to the first centuries of the Common Era. And from left, we have a quarter shekel, um, from the First Revolt, year four, so approximately 69 to 70 of the Common Era, and the Paleo-Hebrew writing says, for the redemption of Zion. At center, we have an oil lamp from the fourth century, and you see an image of a menorah along with a uh, uh, etrog here and a lulav over here. And this same pairing uh, is found in a pendant from the fourth century as well, uh, and you see the uh, the temple menorah with the uh, lulav and the etrog on the other side here. And David Kramer, Daniel Sperber, and Shalom Sabar have all elucidated in their chapters of the book that the etrog, along with other implements from the temple, were combined to express the hope for redemption and ultimately for uh, the rededication of the temple. So this was kind of a messianic wish to use these particular implements and put them on both communal and uh, personal objects. And going to the next slide, you'll see that the imagery also appears in public spaces in synagogue mosaics uh, and sculpture, synagogue sculpture of both the Greco-Roman and Byzantine eras. So for example, we see on here very famous mosaic from the synagogue in Chamat Tiberias, the sixth, eighth century. Uh, you have again the pairing of the uh, temple menorah uh, with its uh, implements, the shovel, the shofar, uh, the lulav and etrog, and this is kind of duplicated twice for emphasis with a kind of a uh, arc in the center. Uh, so it, it gives you uh, uh, this idea in the synagogues, decorating the synagogues with, with imagery that represents a messianic wish and redemption. I'd like to jump ahead several centuries to the 17th century, when the Etrog container emerges as an object of Judaica created to protect the precious and expensive fruit. And what really intrigued me about etro containers is how the variety of materials and design so closely reflects the artistic aesthetic of the countries in which they are created. And what we see in front of us here is a rare example for a member of the Portuguese Jewish community in Amsterdam. It's a soft textile pouch, not very large, created of silk and metallic threads and this dates from the 1680s, and it's perhaps even the earliest surviving example of an etro container. And what's really fun about it is this pouch features the embroidered coat of arms of a very prominent and wealthy De Pinto family, and it comprises five upward uh, uh, facing crescents over here, right, uh, at center, set in a shield which is topped by a helmet adorned with three ostrich feathers. And you can see at left how this coat of arms 
uh, is, is can be seen sort of from, from a, a drawn emblem. The Jews, as I've mentioned, and I think have been uh, uh, explained, did not have uh, official coats of arms that were given to them by the ruling authorities, but rather they adapted these family crests. And uh, we often see these family crests marking objects of Judaica uh, in Italy, uh, textiles, silver, book bindings, ketubot. Uh, and this is an example of an object created for a wealthy Portuguese Jewish family in Amsterdam. And it, it's, it's really quite wonderful. There are two such pouches in the uh, Jods Historische Museum in Amsterdam. This is one of the two. Uh, a different pair of containers produced for a Sephardi family in Venice is shown here. And this is made, these were made of gilded silver and these fantastic three-dimensional reliefs on top. And the lids are elaborately decorated with reliefs of fruits of apples, pears, and pomegranates. Uh, and the pair were dedicated, as you see at bottom, by Solomon, the son of Yol Aboaf, of Flanders in 1853. And it's presumed that he dedicated, now they're in the Jewish Museum in Venice, and they were presumably dedicated to the Spanish synagogue in, Amst in uh, Venice. Uh, I don't know exactly which synagogue they were dedicated to, but since he was Sephardi, it kind of assumed it was a Spanish synagogue. Um, and it brings to light the idea that these atrobe were very precious and nowadays everybody has their own or at least you know one family has their own. But in earlier periods, a community could have one etrog for the entire community to share or maybe two or three or four. And Josh goes into this in his chapter about who gets the etrog first, as does uh, Ted Fram and, and Deborah Kaplan. Uh, and there was a whole uh, sort of uh, written uh, um, documentation uh, and, and discussion about what happens when there's only one etrog to a community. And so having two uh, containers uh, that would have housed the synagogue etrogim it, you know, it was quite precious, was not entirely surprising. The earliest extant silver container that we know was used for a trogium are from early 18th century Frankfurt. And that's what you see here in the screen in front of you. And these were fruit form boxes uh, created by Christian silversmiths. <clears throat> they were not created necessarily as etro containers, but they were easily adapted uh, by Jewish clients. And in fact, it's interesting how closely the shape models that of the etrog itself. Um, and sometimes even sort of the bumpy rind is, is, uh, is, is created as part of this uh, fruit form boxes. And uh, sometimes they have Hebrew inscriptions on them. The early ones don't because they weren't created as Hebrew, as, Jew as Judaica. But in the 18th century, you find other household objects that were adapted for etro containers. And I think the most common of these is this object on the right, which is a sugar box. Sugar was a very expensive uh, uh, um, food. And uh, you see here a zucker dos, uh, which is often a decorative oval or rectangular container embossed with floral or other designs. And uh, you actually see over here, ah, you don't see over here. Some of them have locks and keys. This here, we're seeing the back of it. You don't see the, the lock on it, but this is from Augsburg from 1730. It's sitting on four feet and it has an ornamental uh, hinged lid. And the conversion into an etro box was relatively simple and uncomplicated. And in fact, it's not uncommon to find a fine silver sugar box that was used by Jewish patrons as their personal etro box. And over time, these boxes were made more Jewish with the addition of Hebrew inscriptions pertaining to Sukkot. Um, and you know, you might have verses from the Bible or, or verses uh, about the four species more specifically. Um, the object at right, which is a wine prober shala, uh, a wine tasting, uh, a wine taster, is something is an object that I had fun researching because I saw several examples of this in the Jewish Museum of Prague. And this is an object that was used uh, during tastings to taste the wine in dark cellars and in rooms lit by candlelight. 
And uh, the forum, it's not a large thing, uh, has uh, grooves and indentations. And when the light hit these grooves and indentations, it enabled the clarity of the wine and the density of its color to be assessed. So um, these were taken, these were used not really as protective boxes, but they were really a wonderful way to be able to, um, to sort of store the etrog and show off this very precious fruit. Perhaps not as protective, um, but, but certainly you know, a wonderful example of a way in which uh, an, an object that would have been used in a wealthy home as a wine tasting object was repurposed for Judaica. In the early 19th century, we begin to see the creation of etrog boxes, etrog containers that were purpose made. Um, in other words, we can see from the design, from the illustrations, uh, from the inscriptions, that these were created as etrog containers. And what you're looking at is a magnificent and profusely decorated German silver box that was presented by two, was presented to Dr. Rabbi Joseph Isaacson, and he lived from 1815 to 1885. And this was presented by the Jewish community of Hamburg, we think circa 1880, which is approximately the years that he was serving there. He originally uh, served in a community, he was the rabbi in Rotterdam until 1871, and he resigned uh, due to differences with the reform-oriented local Jews. And in uh, 1874, uh, he traveled back, and then by the 1880s, he was all, he traveled back to his birthplace, the town um, in Poland. And by the 1880s, he was the rabbi. He relocated to Hamburg. Um, and what you see here, directly beneath this magnificent three-dimensional sculpted etrog, which crowns the box, is an elaborate dedication uh, on the left-hand slide on the left hand of this slide, and it continues on the laurel leaves surround, that surround it, and enhancing uh, this box uh, and associating it with Sukkot are these wonderful scenes on the front and back of the box. And at left, you see the tent-like dwellings of the Israelites during their 40-year uh, uh, sojourn in the desert after the Exodus, where they were protected with divine clouds and this idea that on Sukkot we sit in a sukkah uh, to remember that God protected us that the, uh, during this 40-year trek through the desert. And we see a family seated in a sukkah. This is modeled on Picard's uh, image of a sukkah, which I actually should have brought here. That's Time is short next, for the next time I give this lecture. Um, and at right, you have a very interesting um, image. This is the image of Hakel. Uh, and hakel uh, is a ceremony that would take place on the Sukkot following the sabbatical year. So this year, uh, there would be the ceremony of hakel, where the king of Israel holds the Torah scroll from which he is about to read, and the high priest and the other priests watch him in front of a crowd of Israelites assembled on the Temple Mount. And this is not a scene that we find in most objects of Judaica. It's quite rare, and it's very clear that whoever created this was quite conscious of the imagery uh, that would be manifested around objects used on the holiday of Sukkot. With the rise of the Zionist movement in Ottoman Palestine, uh, it, there was a burst of creativity of Jewish art and, and Judaica and material culture. And this uh, was especially so with the establishment of the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts in Jerusalem in 1906. And we have the production of decorative art objects by craftsmen associated with that school. And what we see here are two etrog containers created by the Jewish artists of the Betzalel School. And they demonstrate this wonderful meeting of East and West. So the artists are taking this shape, this idea of a European object, an etrog, a metallic etrog container. Uh, they did this with other things as well, like spice boxes, but they were using designs and motifs that were influenced by the handicrafts of Islamic lands in these objects. So for example, the uh, etro container from the Israel Museum at left is brass inlaid with silver, and it's a typical of the Damascene decorative technique that you find in Damascus in Syria. 
At Wright, you have expert Yemenite silversmiths who were employed by the Bitsalel School and they brought their longstanding tradition of craftsmanship and precious metals to produce Western objects. And this is reflected in a filigree etrog box. And it's wonderful because the sides of the box, I'm not sure if you can see it here. I'm not sure if my, my arrow is, is showing up, but over here and, um, and over here, are these uh, two ancient Jewish coins, which they set into the filigree work as a reminder of the sovereignty of the Jews uh, in their land. In the early 20th century, uh, Sharon we uh, Weiser Ferguson documents in her chapter, artists experimented with modern forms and challenged the traditional style. So I'm actually not showing you objects in the early 20th century, but you can uh, see, see them uh, in her chapter in this book. Uh, I'm showing you at left a wonderful etro container by Ludwig Volpert, uh, who was born in Germany in 1900 and then uh, made Aliyah to Israel uh, in the 1930s and fashioned and uh, these fantastic polished etro container uh, in the 50s. And then he actually left Israel and came to New York and uh, founded the Toby Pasha workshop in the Jewish Museum and worked there until his death in 1980. And uh, he creates this really elegant container with sleek lines engraved with the Hebrew words pre eitz hadar, a beautiful tree fruit. Um, so the lid defines it as an etro container. And he chose a modern style and he kind of expressing his commitment to the renewal of Judaism and, and Jewish life um, in Israel and, and then around the world. And at right, I'm bringing to you the etro container of Menachem Berman, another wonderful, wonderful uh, and very accomplished uh, Judaica artist who was working in Israel in the second half of the 20th century. This is from 1986. And you can see that he has created this form, which you can pick up and actually carry on your way to shul. It's this fantastic um, form and function all in one. It both holds the etrog and it enables you to carry it with you to synagogues. He's really thinking about the object and, and how to make it usable. And in the last slide, I wanna show you a shift away from etrog shaped boxes and designing uh, to a, a this etrog wrapped produced by Sarai Srulovic, uh, who is a Batal graduate and a Jerusalemite silversmith. And she's really thinking out of the box. Uh, in the 20th century, this is from 2010, uh, and designers, she employs like this different solution for encasing the etrog. And it's really a very innovative design where she wraps it, going back to this concept of Hidur Mitzvah, wrapping the Torah scroll, she's wrapping uh, the etrog, uh, uh, and she's combining textile and silver as Menachem Berman did in a new format. She's creating kind of a shield of armor for the etrog. So you have both a textile wrap and a, an outermost layer of a, of a bag um, that makes it very easy to use and to transport. And through these modern experimentations with form and function, the etrog uh, has been and continues to be an essential part of authentic Jewish expression of creativity and continuity. And it engenders these wonderful designs and there's quite a bit more to be said uh, about them. And for that, you'll have to uh, read the chapters in the book where Shalom Sabar and Sharon Weiser Ferguson uh, uh, goes into more detail about this wonderful artwork. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, th those are three wonderful um, introductions to different parts of the etrog. Um, and for me, the day after Rosh Hashanah, this is a, a really wonderful time to be looking forward to um, the weeks ahead. I want to encourage um, those listening to submit questions on um, the Q&A, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. I want to start with um, a question for each of you um, about your own area of expertise and then to pose a couple of questions um, to the three of you together. So I'll start with Alex. 
Um, I, I love the idea of the etrog sitting uncomfortably um, between socialism, religion, and Zionism. And it made me think of um, the coins that Sharon showed at the beginning of her presentation about um, from the first revolt um, and also later coins like, like the Bar Kokhba revolt. And it strikes me that the etrog has this long history of fitting in or symbolizing not only redemption but Jewish nationalism um, and military strength and sovereignty. And I'm curious to know in your sources on the kibbutz or more generally um, in Zionist um, and modern Israeli halakha and, and history, if there's engagement with that dimension, that ancient dimension of the etrog in, in the modern period. So that's my question for you, Alex. Um, for Josh, I'm curious um, to know a little bit more about the domestic sphere um, and to ask you to reflect on the etrog as potentially um, an object that exists not only in the synagogue, but also in the home. Um, and um, possibly also to think through um, questions of gender um, and domesticity, especially um, in, in some of the images that we saw, depictions of growing etrogs and bringing etrogs, um, there are usually men. And so I'm curious to know um, what about the children and the women and that space. And then for Sharon, I wanted to ask you about um, one, one thing that struck me about the cases that you showed um, is that part of um, part of the dimension of the cases is this hidur mitzvah of making um, the, the, um, the ritual as beautiful and special as possible. Um, and there are also these ostentatious displays of wealth. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about um, that interplay between wealth and poverty on the one hand, this idea that everyone ought to have their etrog um, and own it, and that um, in rabbinic sources, the, the smallest etrogim or the cheapest are actually not so expensive, and yet you can actually um, go above and beyond um, and sort of how that plays into um, histories of wealth and poverty and aesthetics um, in Jewish history. So I'll, I'll let you guys answer those questions? I guess I was asked first, so I'll answer first, um, even though I'm very torn because I'm intrigued to hear the answers of the other panelists to the brilliant questions that you just posed. Um, but most definitely, um, the, the phenomenon that you observed of the Etrog being associated with Jewish power strength, um, not just nationalism, but actually messianic redemption um, um, and self-sufficiency definitely come up on the religious kibbutz. And it, it comes up in a, in a number of ways. Um, most especially, um, the, there was a big drive on the religious kibbutz, but actually on the Yishuv and, in, in, and, and the early state of Israel in general to, if you're gonna buy an etrog, buy an etrog that is grown in the land of Israel. And um, on, on the one hand, this seems just like a, a sort of um, a, a religious, almost sort of, um, a, a religious ideal almost um, embedded in a sort of Kabbalistic ideas of the holiness of the land of Israel and the holiness of things grown in the land of Israel. And that certainly was there, especially on the religious kibbutz, where people were very engaged in agricultural life. But it overlaps with the Zionist idea in general that the whole point of Zionism, and this was true for political Zionists like Ben Gurion, it was true for cultural Zionists like Bialik and Achad Am. The whole point of Zionism is to um, sort of drag Jews out of what many Zionists thought of their degeneration. This is what they called it, that degeneration in, in, in exilic life, where according to the Zionist mindset, Jews were all kind of pale, pasty, bookish, weak, passive individuals. And instead, be in a place where you can be self-sufficient, work the land yourself, get your hands dirty, literally, um, and 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 of course, in, in um, certainly in pre-state Zionism, there was an ideal that Jewish farmers should use only Jewish labor 
as opposed to the often cheaper um, Arab um, workers. So um, there is this sort of religious ideal of using Etrogim from the land of Israel, but it overlaps absolutely with this kind of tremendous sort of nationalist upswing. And the Etrog was a was a was a kind of cultural manifestation of all of these ideals overlapping at the same time. I guess if we take the questions in order, <laughs> perhaps okay. perhaps I'll move next. Um, sorry, thank you so much for that question. I'm delighted that you asked it. Um, questions about gender um, not only inspired us as we were moving through. Um, as we're moving through inviting scholars to uh, contribute to the volume, but it's something that thrummed through scholars' responses as they contributed their different chapters here. And I'm also uh, trying to be attentive to the Q&A. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have time to discuss all of them, but what I can say to you is that virtually all of the questions that are being asked, the answers can be found in different chapters by different <laughs> contributors in the volume, which is really not, not meant as a plug, but just um, to crow about how wonderful the contributors to this volume were. Um, in their creativity, in their scope, in their reach. Uh, this was a truly collaborative endeavor, uh, and, and we hope and believe that it shows. When it comes to the question of gender, uh, the history both of women's experience and of gender dimensions in particular, I must confess that at first we had some difficulty thinking our way around some of these corners. The etrog um, was constituted quite early on as an object and artifact of ritual experience, belonging primarily to the province of men was a time bound commandment that rabbinic law would officially exempt women from. And yet there are delightful examples that both help us to explore the history of women and gender, both in their presence and in their silences. Um, uh, one that I, I alluded to briefly was from a, uh, a chapter in which Jordan Katz explores folk customs, remedies and beliefs that the etrog itself, because it was the object of the original sin of woman in the fall from Eden, was also the, and which then inspired or provoked a divine judgment of pain during childbirth, was then precisely the best thing to be a remedy for it. And an early modern custom prevailed in which women would hold on to, bite, eat the etrog as a means of ameliorating the most difficult birth pangs of childbirth. But of course, the etrog appears in the synagogue as well, which was a space that in theory and very often in practice was one from which women were largely excluded. And yet all the same, Deborah Kaplan and Edward Fram in their chapter look at rabbinic responsa and custom literature and actually show the passing of the four species, the etrog among them, from the men's synagogue to the women's synagogue in early modern verms. I understand that you wanted for us to think about it in the domestic as well as in the synagogue sphere. And we're very, very fortunate to have what seemed to be two examples of at least quasi-domestic artistic renditions. Um, in Evelyn Cohen's chapter on medieval manuscripts, she looks at a 15th century manuscript in which women and children are depicted holding out their arms prepared to receive the lulav and etrog. And I'll show that, I'll share my screen in just a moment. What's so wonderful about being able to do this on Zoom is we get to show you, we get to show you the artifacts in real time. And equally striking is an etro box that was designed by the um, artist Ilya Shore in a chapter written by Sharon Weiser Ferguson, in which a man and a woman pass the four species to each other under the canopy of a sukkah. Um, perhaps most, um, or at least obvious from the spiritual side, but just as important, and I think this responds to one of the questions in the chat box, is in the 20th and 21st century, the etrog has found its place in two recipes. Uh, the kitchen, traditionally the province of women and gender. I will say that we were actually quite tempted to include recipes for what you can do with the etrog at the end of the volume. We opted in the end uh, to leave that out, Although I might also draw our attention to the home and domestic spaces that are explored in the story of Shai Agnon that is introduced by Jeffrey Sachs at the end of our volume, in which a young boy is tempted and ultimately succumbs to the temptation to bite off the pitom of the etrog within the confines of the home. So the etrog certainly moves from synagogue into home in a variety of different ways that point to gender relations, generational relations, um, and just before my time is up and I pass the baton to Sharon, I would love to very quickly show you the yeah. two images that I, I have one of them here, Josh. Does it show Brilliant. up? Brilliant, thank you. 
Thank you. Are you able to enlarge it, Sharon? Uh, yes. Is it that small? There you go. You see the, the husband and wife up here. Can, is that large now? It's a little tough to make out. I wonder if it, if it could still get bigger. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So there are husband and wife, or Sharon, if you want to describe it. No, no, good. Let's see that. This is... <laughs> there are husband and wife uh, standing apparently under the hupa or marital canopy, either passing the, the lulav and etrog, the four species, one to the other, perhaps holding them in tandem. Um, I think it might have been a sukkah they're standing in. That was my impression of the matter, but... That probably makes much more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the... Excuse me. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I've here, got the medieval one. I'm happy to show the medieval one. You've got that here. Let me start. I do. Uh, let's see. That should is that visible? Can you see it? Yep. Fabulous. So here we see what appears to be a family, um, what appears to be a um, the patriarch of the family holding the four species, and there is the rest of the family presumably wife and children who are all ready to receive, partake, and participate in the ritual. Yeah, Evelyn Cohn, uh, Professor Evelyn Cohn has written a wonderful chapter about the image of the etrog in Hebrew illuminated manuscripts. And uh, she's made some wonderful discoveries and it's it's it, it's a, worthy of a lecture of in its own right. So uh, I, I left that to her. I didn't, didn't take upon that myself, but, um, I thought that maybe I would just say one thing about uh, the etrog as an object of expense and preciousness and these sort of silver boxes that were created to, to house it and to protect it. So I'd like to, um, to give credit to my colleague Bernhard Purin, who is uh, the director of the Jewish Museum in Munich. And he actually found regulations from the first half of the 19th century, from the Munich synagogue, uh, 1826 to be exact, where they prohibit bringing etrogium to silver boxes in this to the synagogue. I don't know if that made it into our book, Josh. I think it may not have. We saved that for the talks, um, so, uh, or maybe for Bernhard to be able to to use at some point. So um, this is interesting because it shows that they that people. The authorities, either the rabbinic authorities or perhaps, you know, the the authorities uh, of the Jewish community, uh, not necessarily the rabbinic authorities, um, but the heads of the Jewish community felt that it was too showy an object, that these were in fact beautiful cases. They were they were done out of coconut, they were done out of ivory, they were done out of silver, uh, some of the lesser ones out of wood, but still beautifully carved. And, and they actually slapped some Shoya laws on it and said, no, no, yeah, you can't bring this to synagogue in 1826 in Munich. And I think there's a new book by Professor Rackover on, on some Shoya laws, an entire book about this. And I haven't gotten a hold of a copy yet, but it would be interesting to see uh, if any of the regulations that he uncovered includes, includes some of this, because there is this tension between a, a luxurious object um, that you're, it's sort of flaunting a little bit, uh, and yet the need to protect it. And, you know, if you're going to protect it, why not do it in the most beautiful way? So, so there you have it. Thank you. Oh, in our last couple of minutes, if it's okay, I want to ask a couple of questions that came in, um, in, in the last few, um, minutes, um, and then end with a broader question, um, a couple of the questions. One is, how did the etrog become a, the pre etzadar, or rather, how did the pre etzadar become the etrog? Um, the second is, um, is the etrog used in other cultures, um, and if so, for what purpose? Um, and lastly, what's your favorite piece of evidence um, or a, a source from the book? Okay, um, I'll answer that one very quickly and then Josh could, could take the rest. Um, they're labeled uh, etro containers in the museums and there's several of them. So, you know, it's just, they've been donated to museums, presumably by people who, whose families use them as etro containers. And, and that was the evidence that, that I have. I mean, 
Um, in fact, it brings up it's very briefly, the two uh, incredible Venetian containers were actually dedicated on the first day of Pesach. And Shom Sabar and I had a back and forth, and he said, no, they're Charosa uh, containers. And I was like, no, Shalom, like if the Jewish Museum in Venice says that they're Etro containers, you know, it's more likely that that's the case. That's what they were donated as. Um, that, that community has a long tradition. But, you know, sometimes we have to go by like how they're presented and how they're received and what evidence they come in with. So it's secondary, actually. It's not, it's it's a reuse of an object um, and, and no other particular evidence. Josh, take it away. Thanks. As you might have seen, I was reaching behind me to grab my copy of the book in order to consult it for the answers. And that, <laughs> that was a deliberate action that I took because I really do want to point to, once again, the different contributions of, of each of the specialists in the volume. Um, when it comes to the question of how did the etrog come to be associated with the biblical verse pre eight Hadar, um, we're fortunate to have two chapters that take readers, people who are interested, down that path. The first is the first chapter in the volume by David Moster called A Path Through Paradise, the Etrog's Ancient Journey from China to the Land of Israel, in which he traces the botanical history of the Etrog in its migration from East Asia through um, Persian Empire and into biblical Israel. And the uh, next chapter that I would point to in order to derive the answer is a chapter by Daniel Sperber called In the Hands of Rabbis and Rebels, the Etrog in Antiquity. The question that, that was asked about the pre-8th Hadar is such a lovely question. It's a perspicacious question that notices that pre-8th Hadar is not obviously the Etrog. In fact, the word Etrog appears nowhere in the Tanakh, um, in the Bible. It suggests to us instead that a kind of collective tradition had emerged, but it still fell to the job of the rabbis of the Babylonian Talmud to create the linkages and associations that would um, connect the etrog to this biblical phrase. And in Professor Sperber's beautiful chapter, he explores the interpretive, exegetical, and hermeneutic creativity that the rabbis employed in order to harmonize tradition with text, um, an exercise and a glimpse into the rabbinic mindset and the rabbinic practice of lawmaking as it wove the etrog into the textual traditions of the Jews of antiquity. I think there was another question, sorry, and forgive me, I'm, I, I'm forgetting what it was. I think it was Italy. about, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so one thing that we know, and, and uh, this comes in particular from coverage in a chapter by um, Ephraim Lev and Zohar Amar, is that the etro really was quite common throughout the Mediterranean basin as uh, possessing of medicinal properties. Its Latin name is the Citrus Medica, um, and it was understood by um, really as far back as ancient Greek medical practitioners. So the, the practitioners of classical Greece and Rome all listed the Citrus Medica as um, possessing different medical properties. Arabic medical manuals include the Citrus Medica as having medical properties there. And so while to the best of my knowledge offhand, I don't know of ritual uses for the fruit, it was certainly part of the panoply of, of prized usages from a medical and scientific perspective. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you so much. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time. Um, and I want to thank um, all of you for sharing um, these objects and histories with us. I want to encourage you, all of everyone who's participating, um, to, to look at the book and read through it. Um, um, you can find it on eichlers.com um, and other bookstores. Um, and I, I hope that we'll be able to reflect on other objects and their place um, in Jewish history together um, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. A fruitful new year as we've been wishing everybody.